Okay, so um, in this presentation, I'm looking at uh, saying sorry. And uh, I'm not just saying sorry to a person that you may have heard individually, but how do we say sorry uh, and mean it on behalf of a whole country to the dispossessed original inhabitants of that country? So how do we say sorry for 200 years of poor treatment, which ranges from just ignorance and perhaps disinterest right through to dispossession and even torture and murder? I've got no purpose this evening in talking to you, except perhaps to help us to think together about the pain of past, past atrocities and how they linger and impact on us now. So I'll look at a few attempts to say sorry using Australia as my example. And then I'll also use Melanie Klein's concept of reparation uh, to help understand what's needed and why it's just so hard to get right. Um, and last year I was thinking about this in relation to the ISPSO conference, which was in New York, um, because it had a theme of polarities. And that theme of polarity struck a chord for me because I think we have polarised views in Australia and no doubt elsewhere, um, I think particularly in colonised countries, about Indigenous rights. And just as I was thinking about polarities, well, there was a debate in the media about our National Day in Australia. And the simplistic and shallow level of debate just really frustrates me. Um, this is Australia Day. This is an image from Australia Day. And it's marked on January 26th. We get a holiday uh, and we commemorate uh, the very exciting landing of the uh, first British fleet of convicts and soldiers to Australia's shore uh, in 1788. And every year in the lead up to Australia Day, there's debate about the division that this celebration causes. In September 2018, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, tweeted, and some people might, be, might remember it, about the sanctity of Australia Day, with no apparent awareness of the hurt that this view might inflict on those who were dispossessed on that day. And what he said was, indulgent self-loathing doesn't make Australia stronger. Being honest about our past does, our modern Australian nation began on January 26, 1788. So that's the quote. So there you've got sort of polarities or binaries, if you like, in one tweet. So we've got indulgent self-loathing, if you're on the sort of political left, and that's weak. And we have the correct view, which is the strong view of the inexorable march of progress, beginning with white settlement. And that's a sort of a politically right-wing conservative idea. I'm going to say more about this uh, tweet in a, in a minute. But first, um, let's just think about how we get to the, de the depressive position, Klein's depressive position, um, from these two starkly sort of polarised, I think, split and fairly dis defensive positions. So how do we move to a more nuanced and balanced view of our history? Well, of course, firstly, we have to look at our history. Um, so let me just start by talking about the term sorry business. So this is obviously an English expression, but it is adapted from mainland Aboriginal people in Australia. And it refers to a period of cultural practices and protocols which are associated with death. So the most widespread ceremonies um, of a sorry business are conducted around the bereavement and funeral for a dead relative. But often a sorry business ritual can also be conducted to mark the experience of grief and mourning of the loss of, uh, for example, connection to land, uh, the loss of rights and of children being taken away by the government. And I think Australia has got a sorry business which is still left unattended and unacknowledged. Colonisation has left a legacy of inequality, trauma, shame, guilt and also exploitation. Next slide. So um, this, this image that I'm showing you now, it is in triptych. If you sort of move yourselves around, you can see it. Um, it's, um, it's called The Pioneer. I really love this painting. It's in, my national, uh, in the National Gallery in my state. It was created in 1904 
and it tells the story of the pioneer. So clearing the land and later the growth of cities, um, which you can just see in the background in the third um, panel. I think it's a really poignant picture, particularly when you look at the woman, um, but something's missing, isn't it, from the story. There's a silence here and a forgetting. And the painting, lovely though it is, paints out the true history of how land was cleared in Australia. So this photo was taken in uh, 1930 and it shows um, prisoners being taken to jail for spearing cattle on, on their land. Well, it wasn't their land anymore. Um, we don't like, I think, to look at these confronting uh, images and we prefer to forget. And we have no rituals or protocols for, for dealing with this sorry business of the past. We don't know how to say sorry. We don't know how to conduct any rituals and make reparation. And I think it feels overwhelming for us to think about it and to remember. This slide shows kids that were taken from homes and away from the you know, uncivilising influence of their Indigenous families. And I mean, it's really sad. Look how young they were. They were just babies, some of them. It's from a website where, as adults, these kids try to find each other and their birth families. Uh, records of original families are scant as it was thought better to uh, forget them and to put that behind you. And it seems to me that the past is still with us all, uh, whether we're a colonist, a settler, a migrant, whether we're dispossessed, white or black, and that lack of apology and reparation means that the wounds of the past just don't heal. As a white Australian myself, I can't say how, why or when apology uh, is acceptable, but I want to explore why apology is complex in a social uh, context and how cultural forgetfulness negatively impacts on reparation. I see the impact of colonisation upon our institutions and upon each of us still today. And the Christian churches are complicit. Now, they were the key bodies that accepted the stolen children. As an institution, the church has always supported vested interests, it seems to me, and government. As Maya Janizov said in her book on the work of uh, Joseph Conrad, the civilising of natives, and in his case in the African Congo, was with catechism and capitalism. They went hand in hand. <clears throat> now, there's another day that we celebrate, mm, celebrate in our national calendar, and that's May 26th and it's National Sorry Day. Now, this is the anniversary of the day that the report on stolen children was tabled in Parliament in 1997. Uh, the report was called Bringing Them Home. And it uncovered the, um, the atrocities of stealing young Aboriginal children from their families, a practice that occurred over many generations and unbelievably right up until the 1970s. I used to work with um, a, a person who was stolen. Uh, so it feels so strange to me that they were, you know, my age, sort of uh, younger than me was. Anyway, and this occurred also right up into the 70s in Canada in their residential schools. So there is a push to have National Sorry Day as our national day. But um, we can't really agree with that, I think, because the day reminds us white folks of what happened in our past and it brings to mind the damaging legacy that still remains. I think it feels too overwhelming to look at it. But Melanie Klein argues that if we can look, then it's possible that our guilt is not in fact uh, endless and overwhelming. Apology and reparation are psychic work for individuals, but also I think for colonised nations. There's a social and a cultural dimension to national apology. Clearly, there's also a political dimension, as well as a psychological one. And I think that hasn't been considered much in the discourse about national apology. So uttering apology at the national level brings matters of sovereignty to the fore. And it calls on us to consider who has power and ownership and if it is legitimate. So on the one hand, we may feel apology needs to occur, but it's risky because it acknowledges responsibility for past atrocities, uh, for which maybe compensation uh, is then required. 
and it calls, more importantly, it calls sovereignty into question because it acknowledges the illegitimate power, the illegitimate taking of power and land. It seems almost unsayable. But what's going on intrapsychically? So I have it on good authority from Eve Steele, who said to me that Beyond said, to hear one baby crying is difficult, but to hear a whole ward of babies crying is intolerable and our minds shut out what we cannot bear to hear, see or know. And I think that might be what's going on for us. For Klein, reparation is about making things good again, to mend and repair relationships. And the desire to repair does arise firstly from guilt. So the infant sees that harm has been done and feels that the suffering stems from her own aggressive impulses. You know, at first in the paranoid schizoid position, the uh, infant sees the good and the bad as separate and distinct objects. So it's hateful, aggressive tendencies are directed towards the hated part object. As the infant moves to the depressive position, it sees that the good and bad are actually aspects of the one complete object. Then what follows is guilt for the hurt that is caused and attempts to repair the relationship. So um, I've just got to get used to this. Thing. So if we're going to repair, the first thing that we have to do is see our own guilt. Uh, secondly, we have to actually have a desire to improve this relationship. And thirdly, uh, we have to feel that the other does deserve this offer um, of um, repair. And we have to admit and acknowledge that they, the other has actually been truly hurt by our thoughts or our deeds. So uh, apology does serve a selfish purpose in the first instance. Maybe that's the indulgent self-loathing that the Prime Minister talked about. It helps to maintain an internal sense of being good and to calm anxieties about the power of the other that we've hurt. Klein notes that the move to a depressive position comes first from the one who has done wrong, realising this truth for themselves, mourning loss and wanting to repair. In essence, reparation is about love triumphing over hate. And for Klein, this is the path to maturity. The value in moving to this depressive position is that anxieties can lessen. The other becomes less idealised and therefore also less threatening and terrifying. And as Klein says herself, a seemingly hostile world becomes a more friendly one. She definitely saw the link between the internal psychic life and that of society. And she said that understanding individual personality is the foundation for understanding social life. So I don't think we take her views out of context to consider the enactment of apology and reparation at the national level. So I think the personal is political. And Klein's key insights, um, in my view, was her shift away from Freud's focus on the individual and society into seeing the powerful dynamic of the self and other in relationship. And in addition, she didn't stop at the idea that uh, society civilises our most basic instincts and that we just live with these restrictions um, with anxiety and neurosis. And, well, that's all there is to it. No, she saw that we engage in a lifelong struggle to make reparation for crimes. She saw that we often fall back into a split and persecuted feeling state and that we will repeat this pattern as we aim for true reparation throughout our lives. But if we don't look at the intrapsychic world, then we miss a vital element of why apology at the national level is so hard to do. Apology is an expression of mourning and an attempt to symbolically at least repair the original relationship. It may arise from guilt, but it has love and admiration of the other at its heart. Of course, 
Klein also speaks of manic reparation, where if we retreat from guilt, we may employ apology as a defence mechanism to hide or deny our aggressive fantasies. If apology has an unspoken aim to triumph over a past or has a sentiment of grievance or anger at its heart, then it's manic reparation. This is the fantasy desire that the division being experienced between the two groups should just go away. It's the belief that by simply apologising, well, we can return to a place of oneness, we can have the others stop complaining, or we can have the feeling of guilt for damage done assuaged. It is fantasy, of course, and therefore manic, because the damage has in fact already been done. And that prior state can never be returned. Relationship with the other is damaged by past events and apology is only true when it's brokenness, when this brokenness is acknowledged and responsibility is accepted. Reparation then for me is an embodied and enacted and relational process. It's a part of a sorry business and it requires symbolic action, rituals and ceremonies, as well as material action, of course. Without reparation, we cannot move as individuals or as a nation to the mature and depressive position. I'm happy to have a little break here, if you'd like, for a moment or two, and if there's any questions, or if you just want to stretch your legs, or if you want to go into breakout groups, that's fine with me. What do people think? And you better unmute yourselves if you're going to talk. Or John, would you like to instruct us on the best? I'm happy to keep going for a bit longer. Someone suggested keeping going. Okay, I'm, I can't really see everybody, but I've had a couple of suggestions to keep going, and so I shall. Okay, so what are we up to? We're getting lots of thumbs up, Kate. Okay, good. Uh, plow on. Okay, plow shall plow on. Okay. So Edna, as Shaughnessy said this, that the reparation is psychic work. So I think the task we have, difficult and all as it is, is to try and find some sort of liminal space so that growth can occur. Um, rather than all parties just feeling overwhelmed by what we can't fix because it's past, or perhaps defensively assuming that all's going to be well once we just apologise and get it done, or even that apology is not required um, because the events were in the past. So in 1997, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, gave an apology to our First Nations peoples as a part of the opening of the first uh, Convention on Reconciliation. Now, unfortunately, in that apology, John Howard distanced himself uh, and people today from the atrocities that occurred in Australia's past. Now, I have that video and I'm going to attempt to show you because Indigenous audience members began to stand and turn their backs to the Prime Minister in a gesture of not hearing. So then he deviated from prepared notes and he began defending government policies, which had in all likelihood made the situation worse in the current day. The apology was neither heartfelt nor appropriate and it wasn't accepted. So I did have it in the embedded in my PowerPoints, but I'm just not certain it's going to work. No, doesn't look like it, does it? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and I'll find it on um, YouTube just to show you because it's pretty sort of startling to see. I also need to, in the name of truth and the name of a frank discussion of this issue, to repudiate the claim that my 10 point 
plan involves a massive handout of freehold title at taxpayer expense. That is an absolute myth. It is absolutely contrary to the fact, and I absolutely repudiate it. So, so ladies and gentlemen, I believe, I believe that the plan I have put forward, I believe that the plan I have put forward provides an equitable balance between respect for the principles of native title and the very legitimate interests of pastoralists and others, um, I believe that my 10-point plan provides the only basis of a proper approach. We always knew that Aboriginal children were taken from their families, many in the most cruel and heartless way. Whatever the motivations and intentions of those who designed and carried out those policies, the report provides the detailed evidence of what, what happened. Reconciliation requires responsibility. Yet governments appear to fear this because it might make them liable for compensation. Yet governments pay compensation to many people affected by their policies and actions. When the nation leaders rightly accepted responsibility and took a stand on the guns issue, gun owners were compensated from our taxes. So um, that's the marvellous Pat Dodson there talking. So any uh, the um, any, that's really quite telling. And um, I've got another video which, if I can find, <laughs> I'll put up for you as well. Oh, blemish! It is a tremendous act of respect to actually listen to someone. And it's only when we listen that we can hear what might be beyond the words. Can I introduce to you the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable John Howard. You see how this started and then how it got out of hand. Psychoanalysis is the art of close listening and listening in a way to things people don't know they're saying but are being said anyway. Can I say how very pleased I am to be here today to formally open this convention and let me also thank the Kulin people for the warmth and generosity of their welcome. This convention is a unifying event. It is an occasion for positive commitment to the future and a common avowal of the destiny that we all share as Australians. It is an occasion also for frank speaking. I don't think John had actually ever, had ever spent very much time thinking about history until he became Prime Minister. He'd been thinking about accounting and taxes and maybe social values, but he wasn't someone particularly interested in history. He had a fairly unreflected on history and he was called on to speak in public about so that his strategy is defensive. Governments and leaders alone cannot make reconciliation happen simply through legislation, decrees, declarations or rhetoric. True, rec true reconciliation must come from the hearts and minds of the Australian people in the respect they have for differences, in the attitudes they encourage in their children and in their recognition of the common destiny we share together as Australians. In facing the realities of the past, however, we must not join those who would portray Australia's history since 1788 as little more than a disgraceful record of imperialism, exploitation and racism. His past is a past full of good people and then there are the bad historians in the present who are somehow wanting to attack that idealised past. Such a portrayal is a gross distortion and it deliberately neglects the overall story of great Australian achievement that is there in our history to be told and such an approach will be repudiated by the overwhelming majority of Australians who are proud of what this country has achieved, although inevitably acknowledging the blemishes in its past history. 
<laughs> he was forced to make some concession that Aboriginal people had been murdered and dispossessed. So he makes a concession, and in making the concession, he chooses this word blemish. The blemishes in his past history. This is a blemish on our past. So, so it's, it's this minimising of something which is actually about the very structural foundations of the Australian economy, um, which is based on the dispossession of land, and that's more than a blemish. We need to acknowledge openly that the treatment accorded to many Indigenous Australians over a significant period of European settlement represents the most blemished chapter in our history. So here is a, a Prime Minister denying that race relations really are at the heart of some of Australia's most intractable problems. So he's denying it at the same time as he's using a word that draws attention to skin colour. Blemishes are on skins, they're on the surface, but blemishes are also on reputations. And Australia's reputation is being blemished uh, in a way that it's, it's very hard for us to, to respond to. It's being blemished by the fact that there were actually people here with the wrong skin colour when we got here. <laughs> the blemishes in its past history. It seemed to me that in this choice of the word blemish, we were seeing the return of the repressed in Howard's public discourse that he was, by using that word, in fact, admitting the very uh, thing he was attempting to deny. And it's only when we listen that we can hear what might be beyond the words. Okay, so that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, I really like Judith Brett's... Um, discussion on on that okay back to my slides and we shall carry on so this is just putting up um, the latest Prime Minister's tweet again for you to have a look at it and a think about it um, so I think the comment that he makes there is very interesting because it suggests that those who grieve for the loss of society and culture before white settlement are indulgent and that this is unhelpful. And um, if we're going to make Australia stronger, we mustn't be indulgent. Uh, the comment also raises questions, well, is Australia weak in some way? Does it need to be strong? Does it need to be stronger? What's lost and gained in terms of making it stronger? It seems that weak and strong are being put forth in this little tweet as binaries, with weak being bad and strong being good. I think further questions are raised by the comment about indulgence. So the Prime Minister portrays indulgence as a negative state, uh, as if it's a weakness. Um, but if you actually look at the dictionary definition uh, of indulgence, it means being liberal, tolerant, forgiving, merciful and humane. So strangely, the word indulgence has come to mean weakness and failure but actually being merciful and tolerant is the path to reparation. It's one of the first steps in undertaking work that repairs the broken relationships of the past um, and can allow Australia to see that we may be worthy of forgiveness by those who white settlers have wronged starting from January 26th, 1788, but still I think continuing today. It is in keeping with the prevailing ideology of capitalism that the Prime Minister would consider any form of guilt or regret over the past as self-loathing and therefore anathema. Embedded in his comment is the view too that the way things are now is the best and only way and that, that life can be and that things began for us in 1788 and um, 60,000 years of living by another group of people uh, don't seem to mean anything. Also encoded in the comment is the view that we must only look forward and not back, that the past is irrelevant and that Australia is on a trajectory of growth and forward momentum, but I wonder at what cost. The Prime Minister's tweet perfectly encapsulates for me the binary position that I say is not conducive to true reflection 
and deeper growth, but rather maintains that ideology of us and them and leads us in a frozen and, and static and binary uh, position of distancing ourselves from the past. You so often hear, well, what has this got to do with me? It happened 200 years ago. Or why can't they just get over it? Um, we often hear those sorts of things in Australia. I think this is Klein's um, paranoid schizoid position. I think it's split. Um, if I, as a white person, am to think well of myself, I have to just sort of forget the injustices that have occurred. And I have to really just blame those original inhabitants and in fact, colonized people everywhere for their failure to hold onto the land for all their current troubles. In this position, I can't feel any love for them. Well, or failing this, the emotional pendulum may move in the complete opposite way and I may be overwhelmed by guilt and think of myself as the bad one because I'm the inheritor of violence and dispossession. And so I may then think of First Nations people as faultless and idealise their life before white settlement, seeing only good there in a split and somewhat envious way. So then I don't truly love them, only my idealised version of them. Neither position is realistic. Both views are extremes of the desire to rid ourselves of grief and guilt over past trauma. But it is only in seeing both good and bad in self and in the other that a more congruent and complex response can emerge. Um, that's Klein's so-called depressive position. It's a fantasy, of course, to believe that we have each made our successful lives on our own merits alone. We've each made lives according to the abilities we have, to the opportunities that we've been given and the support of others, and that includes those who came before us. There is a direct link to the past in what we achieve now. But the guilt of having achieved off the suffering of others, I think it's too hard to accept so we deny the truth of it and we get caught in blaming victims of their own situation and in claiming any success that we have as our own personal hard work. This individualising is rewarded and it is reinforced in the modern era, as has been demonstrated by our current Prime Minister and, as I've shown, Prime Ministers before him. I think the market economy has become hegemonic it invades all aspects of our society and culture. Institutions deliberately promote the idea that anything worth having is scarce and hard to win and that we're all individuals working hard for our individually prosperous futures and that everything is equal and that what happened in the past is irrelevant. These ideas are so pervasive that we tend to believe them to be self-evident but it's not the only way, obviously, to see life on Earth. And it was not the way First Nations people saw life. They saw it as relational and the Earth as abundant. Okay, so um, in this, this, is, this is another attempt to say sorry, and it's Paul Keating. This is in around 1995, I think. Um, when he, he uh, it's called the Red Fern Address. It's part of the Red Fern Address. So then he really, if you read it, I'll give you a minute to read it. He actually really describes everything that went wrong. Okay, it may be worthwhile mentioning that who Paul Keating was for our overseas visitor. Oh, another Prime Minister. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just another Prime Minister. So I'm looking at, I look at um, John Howard, um, current Prime Minister Morrison, also Kevin Rudd, another one, and Paul Keating, those four and their various attempts. And for me, Keating did the best. Um, I can talk about Rudd as well, because he he did do, I've got a few notes on him. Um, he, he made a, a part of his election campaign that the first thing he would do was an apology. Um, and he did that in 2008. So uh, it was 
it was well received and it had several aspects of a well-spoken apology, including specific suggestions for, um, you know, what needs to be done to uh, address the uh, wrongs of the past. But it did actually ask to be accepted by First Nations people, which is a sort of a no-no in a good apology. It's up to them to decide if it's, you know, to be accepted. Um, and it did have a somewhat romantic view. I mean, there were things like, oh, we can build a future together. So it was a little bit on the sort of rose-coloured glasses side. Um, and I think it's one thing to feel good after having spoken a fulsome apology, and it's quite another to do the work of reparation. Uh, and not a lot, of course, as we know in Australia, has actually been achieved in terms of reparation. I think that's going to take quite a lot of um, generations. But the thing about um, Keating is that he sort of, he says we've got to work, walk in the shoes of the other. Apology is nothing really in my view without reparation. And by that, I mean repairing, mending, renewing or restoring relationships that have been damaged by previous bad behaviour. Reparation identifies and it names and it speaks the truth of suffering, loss, guilt and brokenness. True reparation acknowledges that it isn't actually possible to return to the state of uh, being prior to the loss or the change, but it does still seek to repair. The desire to repair comes from love and admiration of the harmed person, so that guilt is experienced when we see that we have hurt or diminished the loved person in some way. I think Australians are by and large stuck in terms of apology and the love and admiration of the harmed persons is replaced by hatred and or envy, fantasized and idealized. I think the guilt and the grief over what was done is so overwhelming that we can't see the other in a nuanced and realistic manner. So we can't love. Without this, our guilt is overwhelming and we can't face it. If we can't face our guilt, then we can't seek to repair. So reparation is either manic or it's denied. I worry that our fear and guilt makes us unable to move. We are bystanders to atrocities still going on around us. So here we have the stockman and the cattle. In the past 200 years, Australia has grown and prospered, but you have to think about at what cost. The land was obviously not empty and farms and industry were developed on stolen land. We all know this dark truth. We fundamentally deny the injustice on which the nation's prosperity is found. We immigrants have all prospered from the fiction that the country was empty, unused and unoccupied when white settlement began. White Australians tend to look back at Australian history um, as we reflect on the farmer, the stoic man of the land, taming the land, battling drought, overcoming resistance and building the country from agriculture, livestock and extraction of resources. It's such a male view of the past and it's based on that Judeo-Christian notion of sovereignty by subjugation and domination of the land and animals of the earth as if it is a God-given right to do so. But of course, the picture is a lie too, not just given the fact that many early settlers and churches and later soldiers were given land for free while others simply took it, and that's the squatters, which we learned in history, but embedded in the lie is the notion that it was only when Europeans arrived did the land yield up resources and become productive and useful. So um, th uh, th this, th oh, hang on, this photo here, that's a photo that I took. It's 30,000 year old um, rock art in Northern Territory, and it's got a turtle and some fish. And the idea of it was, that um, um, that the la you you painted what you wanted the land to yield up for you in terms of abundance, so that the land would give you what you needed. Um, so First Nations people lived with a view 
that the earth brought forth what was required in abundance if only we acknowledged the creator and the creator's good works. But Europeans brought their ideas of individualism, competition and scarcity to a foreign place with the supreme self-belief that what they knew was going to be right for this place too. And we now suffer extinctions of local species from introduced species. We've got hooved animals which compact the soft earth we have in Australia and cause water runoff and silting of rivers, um, which if they're not redirected for irrigation of crops that really don't belong in Australia, um, then they're full of introduced uh, species into the water like carp with native species finding it hard to survive. Just as it is a lie that the land belonged first to no one, so the notion that Australia's first people did not work the land is also a lie. Um, some of you might have read um, Bruce Pascoe's work, Dark Emu. He's got some great examples in there of fish traps that were used for over 3,000 years. He also says that um, the early explorers talked about seeing whole fields of, um, of a wheat type substance being grown. Uh, this is another picture that I took in the Northern Territory. I'll just sort of explain it. You can see sort of a little bit to the side there, they're burning off. So this is what we do. If you're not from Australia, you may not know. Um, fire is the way that new life grows and we've been burning off undergrowth uh, for a long, long time. Uh, people will say 30,000 years. And the fact that this way of... Um, containing the forest and making it um, safe and livable and usable has been going on for so long that whistling kites, this type of bird, has learned over the generations to fly into smoky, um, you know, fire burning areas. And why does it do that? Because it knows that all of the insects and little animals are all dashing out from being... Um, uh, you know, burnt in the fires, and so they get a very good meal out of it. Now, they've learned that, not in five minutes, but over generations, because this sort of maintenance of the land has been going on for a long, long time. Um, I did have a photograph, but I didn't put it in, of um, kangaroo grass being actually harvested right now in Victoria, um, and this, uh, they're trying to bring it back. So there are many books and reports that indicate that the ancient land of Australia was for the most part really being ruined by 200 years of European practices of farming, uh, farming and mining, which just didn't belong here. Whereas in contrast, the land was used and sustained for at least 60,000 years by its first inhabitants. And new research is even suggesting 80,000 years of continuous habitation. I mean, that's just extraordinary if you think about it. I mean, the last ice age ended 10,000 years ago. So they were around a long time before that. Um, I think the truth of the land being actually used and, and worked is, is a, it's, a, it's a lie. It's a truth that's hard to um, accept. And it calls into doubt that sovereignty and legitimacy of white settlement. Our sense, I think, of national pride is compromised by this truth. We try to separate Aboriginal problems from the rest of society, and we do perceive maybe dimly that they are in fact linked. The guilt we white inhabitants feel is sometimes overwhelming, and it's got to be eliminated or jettisoned. It's too painful to acknowledge and absorb the truth of the cost of our prosperity and the damage done to the land as a, and to a whole people as a result of it. So for me, when I feel stuck in that paranoid schizoid position, it's a retreat to the family narrative that we too were oppressed and treated just as poorly. So I'm going to turn now to um, some personal reflections. So this is the um, famine statues in um, Dublin. And I put them up because my family came to Australia from Ireland, both my mother's family and my father's. On my father's side, a brother and a sister survived the famine and came to Australia seeking opportunity and gold in the 1850s. Now the sister caught tuber tuberculosis on the boat out 
and she died six months later, aged only 23. On my mother's side, the first ancestor to come to Australia was convicted and at first sentenced to death for threatening an English spy and telling him to leave the small town where he lived in Ireland. On a second trial, he was sentenced to life in Australia. That ancestor of mine was part of a secret society aiming to disrupt unfair British laws in rural Ireland. He was transported for life in 1828. <clears throat> My family narrative is that we were Irish refugees and political prisoners fleeing poverty, injustice and persecution. So while I can feel empathy for the plight of the native inhabitants of the land, I find that sometimes I struggle with a nuanced view of our shared history in Australia because my story is that we too were persecuted. I don't identify with the oppressors and I tend to hold the view that no one in my family benefited from the poor treatment of Aborigines. But of course, this isn't the whole truth. I do know of one ancestor who bought land and farmed it for a time. I don't know much more about that. Obviously, it was stolen land. But here's the complexity. While I want to honour the struggles of my ancestors and acknowledge that I wouldn't be here giving this presentation without their sacrifices, I also have to admit that they must have had relationships with the Native peoples, um, probably not good ones, but strangely, the family history is completely silent and forgetting of that story. And I'm only here today because of both their sacrifice and their suffering, and also because of the helping hand they had by simply living in Australia, no matter how they arrived. They aspired to have the wealth of the country. They bought into the European myth of the heroic individual marching forward in progress. While they felt things were not fair and equal for them in the old country, rather than question the cultural norms of a European capitalist vision of how to live, they bought into it. I find it hard not to retreat into a defensive and a split and a sort of a competitive conversation of, well, my suffering is just as great as your suffering. But measuring whose pain is worse closes options for dialogue and growth. And it betrays the hegemony of the dominant view of the world and that my family's acquiescence to it, that everything is scarce, that we're all individuals competing for scarce resources, and that it's a weakness to show empathy to the plight of another. Almost every Australian now has a similar story to mine of dislocation, refugee status, fleeing poverty or persecution. I think it's because of the avoided pain of our own pasts, the desire to have a piece of the rich person's pie and the desire to deny that, that we struggle with genuine apology. It's so easy to slip into the role of the aggressor, to wish to take back power that was taken from us. I don't hate my ancestors for their complicity. I understand how easy it is to be swept along with the prevailing ideology of the time. We're all enmeshed in this worldview. We don't have to side with the aggressor, but I think we probably will uh, if we don't work through the pain of both being dispossessed and dispossessor. When we don't deal with it, the pain is passed on through the generations to be acted, enacted over and over again. To genuinely enact apology, we must face our own complex family pasts and the suffering of it, our ancestors' complicity in theft, our unthinking acceptance of dispossession, the benefits we took from living in Australia and still at the same time, we've got to somehow believe that the political and economic system we labour under is fine and working well. The personal is tangled with the political. The worldview of economic growth and the steady march of progress is embedded in our psyches. The, col the colonial narrative has a grip on our hearts. 
making it hard to be human together and easier to consider matters intellectually with our heads. But I'm speaking of deep emotional truths here. And for me, it's a work in progress, made harder by having few places of community to discuss these matters safely. But, and I'm getting towards the end folks, I think change is possible if only we can face our guilt and listen more carefully. Firstly, I think to our own history, learning to see ourselves clearly and working towards seeing the other clearly requires relationship and connection. But these aren't rewarded or supported in the prevailing culture. So to find a safe place to unpack the family narrative is really hard. Now, this is an image next of Curry Court, which uh, we have in Victoria. So it deals with crime in a, within a different framework. With, it's called restorative justice. It's a real court and the sentences are binding and it's done though in a really novel way. Restorative justice principles are remarkably similar to Klein's view of reparation and they also model the view of apology uh, and reparation of First Nations people. They state that a true apology has several elements which make it authentic. So the person apologising begins with pardon me, an admission of wrongdoing, and the person specifies the details of the hurt caused to demonstrate their level of understanding of the trauma. It's not to make excuses, but it's to say, I, I see now what I put you through. The person takes responsibility for what happened, and he or she expresses regret and offers an apology. And he or she says that it won't happen again and indicates the future plans which demonstrate this intention. This is all done in a face-to-face -face discussion with elders of the community, with the person who's been wronged and with their family members all present. So this whole support of the community is there. And then the next slide, I can show you the sort of um, seating arrangements which we have in Curry Court. There we go. So you can see that it occurs in a circle. Um, it's not that Western hierarchical model of justice with the judge at the top. Uh, it's not a sort of a binary and split notion of right and wrong. And it recognises that to apologise and engage in reparation, one needs support and the wisdom of experienced others to help find a workable solution together. Sometimes those who apologise seek forgiveness from those they have wronged, as we saw with Prime Minister Rudd. But the aim of a true apology is not to beg for or to force acceptance of the apology. That's, that's not really the purpose of a true apology. It's going to be up to the wronged party to determine for themselves if the apology is acceptable or not. But the first step is recognition and acknowledgement of the harm done by the person who is apologising. So how do we face the complex and murky past? How do we live with the fact that it haunts our present and impacts negatively on our future? I'm afraid I don't have easy answers, but I think that listening is the first step because with listening comes remembering. Listening to the other, for sure, but I think first listening to our own pain and guilt. Many of you will be familiar with the term negative capability that Beyond used to describe the place of the analyst sitting and listening to the patient and holding a space for something new to arrive without judgment, without the desire to act. He described a place of inaction, observation, the capacity to sit with uncertainty. Remarkably, there is a word for this in almost every First Nation language in Australia, which is similar to negative capability. Most well known is the Daily River People's term Dadiri. It's been made known to us and given to us by Miriam Rose, and she's a high school principal at Daily River in the Northern Territory. I have a picture of her. There she is. 
So she says the contemplative way of Didiri spreads over our whole life. It renews us and it brings us peace. It makes us feel whole again. In our Aboriginal way, we learned to listen from our earliest days. We could not live good and useful lives unless we listened. This was the normal way for us to learn, not by asking questions. We learn by watching and listening, waiting and then acting. And she also says, we wait for the right time for our ceremonies and our meetings. The right people must be present. Everything must be done in the proper way. Careful preparations must be made. We don't mind waiting because we want things to be done with care. Sometimes many hours will be spent on painting the body before an important ceremony. We don't like to hurry. There is nothing more important than what we are attending to now. There is nothing more urgent that we need to hurry away for. So in summary, I think apology arises. Um, I'll just do this last slide, which shows to Deary. There you go. So in summary, apology arises first from a sense of guilt at harming the other and a desire to repair that relationship. Secondly, taking responsibility for the fact that the other party has been truly hurt and seeking to repair that relationship. Thirdly, it acknowledges that the prior state cannot be returned and so a symbolic act must stand in the place of a true return. Restorative justice principles similarly acknowledge the harm done by the breach that both parties, if they are willing, can meet to hear the apology for harm caused and to hear amends that may be offered with a sense of integration back into society and relationship as a result of the work that is done on apology and reparation. Apology must be understood as an act of remembering, acknowledging and mourning. It's a sorry business. It's enacted in a cultural and political space, but I think without personal psychological reflection on polarities in the self and in society, then it cannot be heard. All aspects have to come together. The personal, the psychological, cultural and political dimensions of the way we live and interact. So the task for those seeking to say sorry is to listen to the hurt parties, truly listen for the pain caused, to see our own stuckness inside a social system which values and believes in individual heroic defeat of the past and individual success as measured generally by material wealth. To have courage that the guilt may not overwhelm us if faced and maybe then hopefully we can hear that another way is possible. The problem is a multi-generational problem. So it's the work of several generations to deal with it. I don't expect perfection of myself in trying to maintain the depressive position. I'm aware that I move back and forth. This is the task of growth. And I know it's lonely to try and contemplate these things without a sense of community around you. But let, let us at least think, listen, discuss, and not be stuck as mere bystanders of history. We need to learn from a culture that has managed the earth here in Australia for maybe 80,000 years before it becomes, folks, too late for all of us. Thank you.